Uh, well, good afternoon again. Um, here we are uh, on the sixth masterclass of the day. Um, we just have one more to go after this. We are grateful to the forum social partner, Samrook Kazina Trust Social Development Foundation for supporting the masterclasses. Yevgeny Sheraznev is going to deliver the next masterclass. Yevgeny is Executive Vice President, Digital Ventures Russia. He is an author, director, and commentator on the Silicon Valley-based digital revolution. Yevgeny Sheraznev, Aka Che, is also CEO and founder at BiolinkTech.tech, an innovative cybersecurity, privacy, and identity management platform. The team behind BioLink.tech builds smart services that gather the information about users and enables them to take over con total control over their private data and digital trail. Che is an entrepreneur, an AI and data management inventor, a TEDx speaker, and more than a tech enthusiast, he actually has a small biochip in his left hand. Che is also one of the first cyborgs in the world. Please join me in welcoming Yevgeny to deliver this fascinating masterclass on digital me from surfing social media to merging with AI and singularity. Welcome, Yevgeny. Thank you. That was a killer intro. Even I heard certain new things in it. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, thank God my invisible tech works. So many invisible friends today. <laughs> um, before we start, uh, I'd like to ask you one question, basically. How did you get here in this room or to this video conference? Well, of course, someone actually invited you to it. Uh, but in order to be invited, you got interested in innovation in media whatsoever. Uh, so at a certain point of time, it, well, I'm assuming you've made certain decisions leading to this point. So you're interested in, in the topic. Before that, your parents met each other. And actually, you got born. And you can actually go further and further in time. And I'm going to cut to the chase. But basically, you being here, the journey of you being here starts a long, long time ago. It starts 13.8 billion years ago. And you will soon understand why I'm starting that early. Uh, my explanation, I mean. So uh, this is where the Big Bang happened. And basically, the, the you know, insanely hot plasma started to, to do miracles with particles, such as quarks and uh, isotopes. They started to form first stars. And what is a star? It's basically hydrogen, the first element, just burning in space. Just this is what a star is. And then basically, it's, it's, you know, the, star, the stars, they just start burning. And uh, the second element started to fuse, helium, because of the conditions that happen in this star. And then all other elements. Uh, and then somewhere in the galaxy far, far away, which is us, so the Milky Way, uh, we got life, which was born. But life is very different. It's not something, you know, just, just a word or something. There are different types of life. During my research, I decided to separate life in you know, three categories, basically. Life one is bacteria. Bacteria is pretty primitive when you apply you know, hardware and software methods of uh, analyzing what it is. So bacteria has no choice over hardware or software because it's born a certain way. It cannot control the way it looks, and it cannot control its function. So basically, bacteria can only do one thing, be a pathogen and just you know, do some damage. And basically, uh, this is the whole point. Uh, bacteria cannot, it's very different from us. It cannot just, you know, had, uh, have a midlife crisis and just start uh, being a bifida bacteria in a yogurt and just be good. You're just basically pretty pre-programmed to do a certain function till the rest of your life. And we people, this is why we're, we're not life one. We're just a different type of life. Life two, number two. And the reason for that is we're all born in a pre-programmed -pre hardware form. So basically, as soon as a baby is conceived, DNA takes over as a blueprint. And basically, uh, as soon as, uh, basically as the woman uh, gets pregnant, it's obvious that in nine month time, there would be, let's say, a boy. And when this boy grows up, uh, he will be 174 centimeters, uh, uh, have dark hair, blue eyes, and predisposition to type 2 diabetes, which is very likely to happen before he is 40. This is what hardware is for, for a human being. Uh, but software, if we don't go to quantum physics, 
software we might be able to control. Basically, we can choose the program. Some might learn you know, physics. Some might learn something to do with art. Uh, some people will learn how to speak English. Some people will study Chinese, etc., etc. The point is, there's no way one person can learn everything. Just not possible. But the thing is, if we apply the same method of classi classifying life, uh, people have a choice of a software. And the trick is that we are not a organic type of life anymore. Because at a certain point of time, our, one of our ancestors, a monkey, he just got very lazy and just took a stick. And at this moment of time, our choice of software just become a, became a bit different. It became way faster. And what I mean is, let's have a look at the dolphins. And I consider dolphins to be the, like organic life. Because when they needed sonars as a tech, you know, a sonar is a thing when you can just basically see and navigate underwater, when you cannot see like physically, optically, but you can do it through ultrasound. And this is what every dolphin has on their foreheads, uh, a sonar. It took them millions of years to build one. And right now, basically, their sonar systems, they're more sophisticated than those we use you know, in our submarines, in some aspects. I repeat, millions of years. It took us a couple of decades when we truly needed a sonar. And this is the whole point. We are not an organic type of life anymore. We are, let's call it, tech type life, or artificial, in a sense that we don't care. If we need something, we just take engineering, and we just crush any problem with this type of engineering. And we're very good with solving problems. If we need something, we solve it almost momentarily. And this is very important to understand when we talk about artificial intelligence and all that. So we basically ignore evolution. And uh, right now, at this point of time, we became hostages of our approach because uh, we started to create what I call life number three, which is artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, is we, and we use the same, the same metrics, it can control or choose hardware, so the form, because AI could live in a phone or in, in an Alexa, you know, thing, or in a TV, or in a driverless car, or in a robot, it doesn't matter, it can be anything. And the second point uh, is that actually AI can choose over time the software, so the program. Because right now, artificial intelligence is very narrow. It just solves very specific problems, like voice recognition or picture recognition or neurovision or seeing cancer cells on, a, on an x-ray or whatever. But those are very narrow applications. But over time, over time, if you sum those up, it, basically you will understand that AI gets more and more capable of doing things. And it doesn't have to choose. It just prioritizes, well, without help, what to learn first. But sooner or later, it would learn way more than any human might actually succeed during the lifetime. And the problem is that as life number two, we're doing right now everything to create this form of life, which is artificial intelligence, which is a different type of life, more sophisticated. Well, not now. Well, the, the truth is, right now, there is no AI. Like, everybody who is uh, meaning AI, and I'm going to stop on that a bit later, just means machine learning is a, it's a different animal. But my point is, right now, artificial intelligence is very dumb, dumb as wood. It just really can do very narrow thing. And right now, human beings, so all of us, every one of us, uh, we are the most sophisticated neural networks on this planet. Every human brain has 86 billion neurons in your head. And God knows how many connections, it's basically impossible. We didn't invent the number to reflect how many connections in between neurons our brain has. Because every neuron has synapses, it could be multiple, but the point is, every simple thought, like, I need to go and pee, it just involves, let's say, five million neurons and more. And this is how complex it is. And um, if we combine all the equipment that exists in the modern society, so all the cloud storages, all the capabilities of Google, Facebook, Apple, all the intelligence services everywhere, IBM, all the phones in your pockets, uh, we'll still, we'll, we won't be able to emulate just one human brain. This is how complex the brain is. And the trick is, even if we try, which is very problematic because most of our hardware power right now mines Bitcoin, and uh, it gets even, <laughs> even more problematic because of that, uh, the problem is energy, because uh, you need to power a neural network or any type of mathematical calculations, actually. So 
our brain, like human brain, works in the sense that I could have a glass of Chardonnay and a salad, and I will definitely it will take me to the end of the day, maybe even tomorrow. Uh, and this is how effective human body is. If you do the same using conditional, like traditional hardware, it's impossible. Just there's no energy right now. Just so you understand, I've read data over Bitcoin uh, dated three, four years ago. And already uh, the, the amount of energy that required for this process it just was equal to the whole energy consumption of Ireland back then. Right now it's even more. And uh, my point is, again, that right now we are very, very superior in terms of uh, what we can do with our brains. And uh, the problem is we actually don't know what our brains can do. And I, I repeat, you will soon understand the connection between digital me and data. Let me take you to a mental experiment, like time travel experiment. Let's say for the sake of illustration that we have a time traveling machine, like for real. And we go to, let's say, to the 12th century, so medieval times. We go there and we see a boy, let's say four years old, like, you know, just not just a baby, but I would say a child who had started to understand the society. And uh, if we wouldn't be there, this boy would grow up in a medieval society and probably grow crops and just die in the age of 30, being called an old man. Because in the, you know, in the 12th century, actually, uh, people used to die at 30 and they were considered old, for, for real, because no medicine, no antibiotics, nothing. But if we take this person to the future, I mean, to our present here, and this boy goes to school and then to the university and studies quantum physics and studies mathematics and understands what medicine is and what literature is and history and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, his brain would be capable to adopt it. And this person from 12th century, he would technically be able to win a Nobel Prize in quantum physics. He would just invent time travel or whatever, a new, a new quantum particle. And uh, my illustration here is, right now, our brain is capable of things we cannot even imagine. Because let's say someone takes us a thousand years from now. I would guarantee if we were you know, young enough, we will adjust, our brain will adjust to the educational system of the future. And basically, you will become an absolute genius for everybody in this room, like combined. Um, but we're not doing that. Right now, we chose a, a different type of path. We decided not to like, basically develop our uh, own intelligence. We're creating an artificial one so we can just outsource stuff and just go. Artificial intelligence, do this, do that. We're just too lazy to do that. And uh, again, good news is right now there is no AI. There's just, there's just machine learning. And uh, to be honest, uh, what fascinates me, most people don't understand that the tech itself, the, the, the machine learning concept, it's been created like in the last century. Uh, technically, the guy who created all modern AI is a German guy called von Neumann, a, a genius mathematician, uh, truly, truly bright one. Uh, bright one. But uh, I consider Alan Turing to be the father of modern computing in the sense that he formulated what AI could be in 1950, for crying out loud. So 70 years from now, this guy knew what we right now watch in the OC, like in the, in the sci-fi movies such as Blade Runner. He already understood that would be a problem of AI growing, outgrowing human capabilities. And I actually rarely recommend books, but I recommend you take this one in Russian. It's called Vychstitne Mashiny Razum. And this book is worth your time. It's just very small, a very thin, thin but it's, it, it explains how all modern machine works uh, work. All machines, they can do only three things. They can get some data as input, apply some calculus to it, and just give you the, the outcome. And those inputs and outputs, they can combine with each other. And this is basically the, you know, the ground base for any neural network. And uh, technically, Alan Turing, we might say, <laughs> invented how all AI or machine learning works. Because it consists of very similar pillars. First is data. Those are just basically rubbish numbers and letters. And then the most important critical thing is classifiers or features. It's basically explanation that this specific set of uh, abracadabra is a number 
which typically means a license plate or a passport or a price for a certain type of property in this area, it's a GPS coordinate or whatever. Basically, this is the more important part. And algorithm or methods of solving certain problems. And the trick is most people think that this third one is a, is a secret, heavily guarded. It is technically true because uh, true leaders of the industry such as Google and IBM, uh, I would say, and Apple obviously, and certain Chinese companies such as Huawei, they know stuff they don't just you know, put on the market. They have certain secrets. But 99% of AI methods, it's just out there. You just can go, and I, I assure you, within one day, you can build your own AI, doing whatever. It's very important to understand that uh, it gets more and more easy to build stuff. And uh, when the first robot uh, by Boston Dynamics was presented in 2009, people were laughing out loud, like, what, what's this thing? It's just insanely stupid. What are you doing? And nobody, nobody laughed in, like, you know, 10, 10 years from there. Because when the robots, they just started jumping and avoiding bullets and do just, you know, amazing tricks, uh, everybody started to understand that it's very serious. Because it can get only better from now. Like, it cannot go worse. People might die sooner or later, but machines, they can only improve. And this is the thing. Just imagine this robot, like, 50 years from now, if this is 10 years progress. And uh, just consider how many things a human might learn when he is in his 50s and he has 10 years. What will, will this person learn? And you will understand how flexible, actually, the machine is and how inflexible our mind gets all the time. Uh, plus, we always think that the machines, they will, you know, take a humanoid form, like in the James Cameron's movies. It's not true, because machine doesn't care about how we look. The machine actually embrace all best cases scenario it might reach to. So basically, if there is a certain best case in, let's say, in the ant farm, or basically, you know, we just look at all insects and you see they're doing something very efficiently, the machine will adopt this technology. Technology. If you see something in, uh, let's say, in the field of energy, or how basically the soil, you know, uh, 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 let's say, uh, absorbs certain type of materials, the machine will understand that this is the best part. It has nothing to do with humans. I'm, I'm, uh, this is the point I'm, I'm making. Uh, AI learns on all life. And... Uh, we have to understand that right now we are moving really fast in terms of uh, connected industries uh, in the between worlds of humanity and artificial intelligence, such as bionics and cloning. We already can grow certain organs, such as, let's say, ears or parts of skin. And I, I guarantee that everybody in this room who wants to have a, an extra liver will actually get it by 2030. Like, it's realistic, so we can... We just, you know, we have to drink in moderation, but the thing is, it's, it's, it's becoming more and more uh, feasible that we can just look at human body as a Lego constructor. And at the same time, actually, the machines, they look at those technologies, look at those technologies with the same, uh, with the same intent, to become better. But people are trying to be more artificial, and AI starts to, uh, to dream about being more human. And this is actually very weird to see. Plus, AI learns a lot about psychology. Uh, for example, right now it already can recognize certain behavioral patterns. The way well, it doesn't, it's not possible to predict or understand what you're thinking of, but it's very, very relatively easy to predict uh, what your reaction is, emotional reaction is to certain types of election. Let's say you see a candidate and machine can tell exactly, you're just looking at the picture, whatever it's Trump or Biden, and the machine can tell whom you will wo wo vote for. All it needs is just to see your eyes at this moment. And we all have cameras, front cameras on our phones. And this is just an example of how uh, sophisticated they got. Uh, plus, uh, recently we got to a tremendous breakthrough. Because AI was always a bit messy uh, with abstract tasks, meaning that they required a very specific, narrowed down a request to make you satisfied with the, with the result. It's not the case anymore. They, they understood how to deal with abstracts. For example, this uh, picture here is the result of AI uh, dealing with a request, hey, AI, could you please give me or show me certain chairs that look like avocado. Which is a weird request, don't you think? Like, just really weird. Just nothing specific. It's very, very unusual. And the machine right now 
can do what you can see on the picture, which is tremendous, just a quantum, quantum break. Because right now the AI can just, okay, I, can, I understand what you mean, I'm gonna assemble everything that is very abstract, but those chests really look like avocado. You, you might ask, like, okay, what's the purpose in that? Like, what's, what's the business value? Well, imagine that basically everything that right now has to do with building stuff, like manufacturing cars, is connected to a future version of this AI, let's say 30, 50 years from now. What you might do is just, you just take your phone or whatever we use that, you know, in 30 years, and you say, hey, could you build me a Maserati, but out of uh, Russian parts or Ukrainian parts, uh, make it 70% cheaper, and I would agree, so it's just 30% slower. You just formulate a request. And the machine can basically do that and then do the uh, homework for you, the engineering homework, and basically create blueprints for this type of car and basically send it to the Chinese factory in Shenzhen and you will get the car next morning. This is why this is important. And the first country who will basically do a pipeline like that, I don't know how to fight with them. I mean, com like com competition would be absolutely illusory. It's just insane. I don't know how to compete when uh, there's a, one country doing that. But my point again, just coming back to AI versus humanity and digital me, is if you compare human being to an AI or set of machines, we are a machine with basically expiry rate. We basically, everybody in this room, a hundred years from now, we will be dead. And this is very important. Machines will, they, they will, they will not die ever unless they have power. And the trick is, I really want you to, if, if I would be voting for one slide you remember today, this would be this one. It would be this one. Because if you're a machine and you try to understand what a human life is, well, it's roughly 30,000 days of calculations. It's roughly 85 years, by the way. So when you're a machine looking at human, uh, what you see is, okay, 85 years, 16 years of learning the models, then you do certain activities, you just do some, you know, something uh, that has value, and then you basically, sooner or later, you die. And the value of a human life, or we all look for life's purpose, right? Well, if we ask a machine what human life purpose is, the machine will say, well, for me, it means, did this person write down his thoughts, or she, you know, her thoughts? If the person wrote down something that he or she invented, this life's, uh, this life's, well, well th this person's life had meaning or purpose. If you basically lived and wrote nothing down, so you, you brought no value to the, to the database, it means that your life had literally no meaning. Well, again, if you're a machine, and the trick is, uh, you see this small dot here uh, to my left. It shows how teeny tiny, uh, uh, how, how little unique information we can generate over the lifetime. Because we read stuff, we watch news, we just consume most, more or less the same content, and then we die, and very few of us, such as, let's say, Stephen Hawking, they, they just managed to create something unique, absolutely unique out there. And this is how little, uh, how little information that is unique we create. Uh, and there is a reason for that, because, um, you remember I told you that our brains, they're, most, they're the most sophisticated neural networks. And the trick is, as soon as a child is born, this child can be anybody and like, you know, anybody he wants. He could be Yuri Gagarin, or could be Elon Musk, or could be Richard Branson, you name it. Just anything, in there, like, there, there are no restrictions. Um, and the reason for that is just kids, they do not compete with each other. They just play with each other, and they don't care about salaries. They don't care about executive positions. They just don't care. It's either fun or not. It's just binary. And the trick is, they want to do stupid things, and this is what they're kids. We expect stupid things uh, from kids. And the trick is, it's very good for a neural network, for this uniqueness that I mentioned earlier. The reason is, when you, when you made a lot of mistakes, this is how you learn. By the show of hands, this is a very small audience, but still I'm gonna ask, who hasn't tried to put scissors in the power socket? Or just tried to put a bulb in your, in your, in your mouth? Never, no, nobody, nobody tried? You tried, nice. <laughs> you, you people, I mean, the rest of you, you never lived. Because, uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna explain you why. I have a close friend of mine. He's a star 
of in, like in, in physics internationally and like one of the geniuses in the field of photonics, like really cutting edge. And we've known each other for like 42 years, <laughs> so since my, since, my, since my birth. And I, I recently asked him like, listen, when was the point of time when you understood that you, will, you want to become a physics uh, engineer? Well, basically it's a, a, sci a, science, uh, a scientist, basically. And he told me, listen, remember, remember we actually uh, you know, put scissors in the power socket and it was a small village in the middle of nowhere and basically we blacked it out. So the village uh, stopped getting electricity for two days. <laughs> you cannot, by the way, you cannot do that anymore because there are the technologies that protect you from doing that. Security is insanely, insanely enhanced right now when it comes to electricity and power. But we did that. And he said, I got very energized. Well, basically he got a shot of electricity, like 220 volts. And he said, I want to understand how it works. So we did a stupid thing, very stupid thing. But the guy, because of the stupid thing, he became one of the best physics in the world, like literally. And he did that just because he did a stupid thing. And when we do stupid things, we're getting amazing. That's why most of the billionaires, such as Elon Musk, they, they never graduated college, uh, college, well, most of them. And then what happens? Most of us get to school. Uh, then universities, and uh, we become pretty much similar in terms of how we think. Because the system is just very interested, so we are more or less the same in terms of our values. Let me ask you a question. Why it is like that? Like, why does the government, and it basically, it's not like it's Kazakhstan or Russia or Europe or Germany or Japan or China. It doesn't matter. Everywhere in the world, Educational system is the servant of basically of the government in the sense that it just its its task is to educate uh, people in a in the amount of x with the sum of knowledge uh, y over the time of z. That's everything that the educational system does, and the knowledge should be very very similar. Why 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 the knowledge should be very consistent? Anyone? All right. <laughs> because people have to be easily combined into groups. Because in order to, to achieve complex tasks like flying to space or build a super mega uh, factory, you need like, thousands of people. And those people should work as, as a team. And if they start to argue with each other like uh, over history or how do they deal with vaccines, it's going to be insane. They will g get nowhere. They're going to kill each other. And this is why uh, it is like that. But the problem is, in the 20th century, it actually, I, I personally understand why it was the case, uh, because uh, uh, our ancestors, they basically ruined this planet over two, you know, global wars. And the governments, in most cases, they were not interested in creativity. They were interested in uh, basically building, rebuilding the roads, the factories, the manufacturing, creating jobs, all those words that nobody wants to talk about, it, but they're very important. And they actually did a very good job, I think. The trick is, this approach doesn't work anymore. We need creativity to survive. Uniqueness. We need stupid people doing stupid things and learning how to do something unique. And the reason is what I called era of replicators. And what I mean is, anyone have ever been to China? Like, many times. So there, there's this city of Shenzhen. Basically, I've been there many times. Like, 20 years from now, it was a literally small village. Right now, it's a, it's a, it's a city slash factory. And it can manufacture anything you want from, from, let's say, a charger to a phone to a car. And roughly speaking, I'm exaggerating a bit, but they can replicate everything, anything over 48 hours. If, let's say, yesterday was a, a new iPhone got presented, I guarantee, like, in 48 hours, there would be a similar model, maybe even better, but it's going to come from a Chinese manufacturer. Name it, electro scooters, cars, driverless, whatever, uh, smart medicine, whatever you, whatever you create, it's going to be replicated in 48 hours in, in the modern society. And it's very important to understand that right now, I'm going to come back for a little, Right now, creating a product, a unique product, what, you know, no, mat no matter how genius the product is, is, it has no value. 50 years from now, you could create a double-sided double scotch and just be a millionaire forever because it's just a unique product. Right now, uh, because of this replication, it's, it's not a value. The value is in the creating a pipeline for innovation that is done on, you know, on the cooldown. So every... every month, let's say. If you're a company that can create new products, innovative, absolutely insanely innovative products, at least, let's say, okay, once a year, once a year, okay, once a year, like Apple does still. 
you have a chance to survive. If you're not, you're basically doomed to fail because very, uh, very few people can innovate. And those basically started to cost like hockey players. There's this amazing writer, Ursula Le Guin, and I strongly recommend you read her works. She once said that a creative adult is a child that survived. And I want you to remember this thing. It's just very important. If you dig to your inner self and you find the child or remember yourself as a child and try to do stupid things and not just take information for granted, you just fight, you find the sources, you try to get to the, to the bottom of this, whatever, the, whatever the, the, this is what you're doing, you will basically be amazing. You will be on this side. And what I mean is there are two types of people. I call them uh, basically uh, cubes and spheres. Cubes is basically 90% of the people. Those are very good people. They just learn in schools. They're, they're very good. Uh, uh, they're very good at whatever they're doing at their jobs, but they are not creative. They cannot surprise you. And you as a manager, as the executive, you can just build out of those cubes whatever you want. You can build a castle. You can build, build a plant. You can build a road. You can basically, this is the whole point of management. What you cannot do is you, you cannot get surprised. They will do only what you ask them to do, and they will do it passively. So if you just go away for a year, you come back, nothing will change. The second type of people, which is spheres, or literally balls, is creative people, so kids that survive the system. So when a child is of certain mentality, somewhere in the point of time of his childhood, the ball starts moving. You just something triggers that. Whatever it was, a cartoon or a movie or a book or uh, he talked to a really creative adult or whatever. But it starts moving and this person will never be the same again because it will hit balls, it will, you know, face blocks, but whatever happens, this ball will never stop. And creative people, all the startup executives, all the people such as Elon Musk, they are spheres. They never stop and you, you never know what they're going to go. And right now there is a huge headhunting war over those people. And uh, do not underestimate the value of those people because just one sphere can change the world because uh, nobody is going to Mars. United States, not, they're not going to Mars. Russia is not going to Mars. China is not going to Mars. Elon Musk going to Mars. And this is very important to understand that this person triggered a huge amount of events. He just basically is the driver, just one person. One person, Steve Jobs is the reason we're here today because uh, he was the, pers the first person to understand, okay, this computer that is in this room and it takes the whole room, it should be in your pocket. Just one person. One person, Satoshi Nakamoto, well, technically I think it's not a person, but a group of people, but it doesn't matter. Let's say it's one person. Basically, over a year, the whole financial system of the world didn't know what to do because he just published a file online. You see, just one person publishing a file online can literally change the course of history. Uh, the problem is most of the people in the corporations, they are very good learners. They're just very good people. They just, you know, study a lot and they just do their job and they just want to be happy. And it's not good or bad, it's just a fact. And what I'm saying is uh, those people who are good people, and this is why we started with AI and this is what I mean by digital me, those people are right now in danger. Well, their jobs are. Because if you, your job can be described in the form of an algorithm, let's say you're a GP, like you're a doctor, but you're a GP doctor, you're not a surgeon. So your work consists of literally very specific, simplistic, roughly speaking, uh, uh, blocks of an algorithm. You meet a person, the person says, I'm, uh, this is something, this is what's wrong with me. The, you as a GP, you just, okay, let's measure your temperature, let's do certain basic, uh, uh, basic procedures, and then the GP just does one of two things. Either you go to the surgeon because he knows better what's wrong with you, to, so he goes to a specialized uh, doctor. Or GP says, this is your prescription, just go away. Nothing is wrong with you. Or it's gonna, you're going to heal over 10 days. I'm just saying that AI can do that. It can do all that, and every profession that can be described in the form of an algorithm can be in danger. Because we all understand, and I understood it a while ago, that all people are data, nothing but data. We did some math with my team, and basically a human being is 43.8 terabytes over the lifetime. Some more, some less, but the point is we all generate a very complex digital trail. Uh, Susan mentioned that basically I've been living with a biochip for 
for six years now. So this is how I personally learned about how complex the digital trail is. And this is why we're meeting here today. Because we did a lot of experiments. We did basically uh, the tracking of searches, uh, you know, GPS coordinates, uh, all types of requests of purchases, uh, all uh, communications, creating for anything I could do with the digital uh, instruments. And basically even uh, controlling access to certain devices over chip, this is a real a real uh, video. And then I realized that basically we are all in danger, like five years from now, like five years ago, sorry. Because I understand that the problem wasn't actual 50 years ago. We didn't have that many computers. But right now, we, uh, we, we are living in a world where computers or networks, they always have feedback about your activities. You purchase something, the machine understands, okay, he is interested in X. You wrote something to someone, the machine starts to understand whatever you're an adult or how educated you are, for example, how many mistakes you make when you're typing. It will understand a lot of things about you because there are so many devices. And right now, uh, Internet of Things, heard of it, is basically exploding. It means that the sensors, they would be everywhere. Even, you know, you go to a toilet and going to be filled with sensors telling you that you're not eating right, that your cholesterol is high. Uh, I, I honestly, I don't want to live in a world when I'm going to talk to John about my cholesterol. I just want to eat steaks and I don't care. But we are moving to this uh, thing. And even the cultural layer has changed. Because remember, our ancestors, let's say two centuries ago, when they met each other, they just used to uh, take hats and greet each other. But right now, if you're meeting someone, uh, a youngster with headphones, if he does that, you are very important. You are very important to him because if you're not important, the, the, the child won't even do that. He won't bother because for him or for her, it's absolutely natural to basically uh, to live in, multi, in, multiple, in the multiverse because he can listen to you, to his friends, and he can consume content of a different sort like a song uh, and it just, okay. But my point is, for me, those are all data points because the person actually uh, just behaves somehow, but the machine understands that the person is in the room, there is an adult, but the headphones were on, so probably with the loud music playing, the child and the adult, they didn't talk. Those things, those, those can be uh, registered and used for whatever reasons. I call this concept uh, digital DNA because when I was self-tracking, I understood that at a certain time, point of time, I, I became very, very predictable to myself. I could, for example, understand that in two, years from, uh, two weeks from now, I won't go to gym at the specific date and time. I didn't know why, but I could predict I won't, something will go wrong. I just, I would basically skip the gym. And uh, I'm not even talking about political views or uh, your purchasing uh, history, or whatever. It's, uh, everything can be predicted with a certain amount of accuracy. And this digital DNA concept is very important because everybody, everybody has it. Every human being, every company. And it's a problem because let's say in, the, uh, actually, it's a, I'm sorry for the typo, it's 1992. In 1992, there was just one million devices connected to the internet. One million. The forecast that my team gives me is it's going to be basically half a trillion devices if you consider a YOT sensors by 2030. Half a trillion. It was one million, literally like 30 years ago. Like the, the growth is exponential. And my point is the computers at first, they were sold as, as tools. That's, that, that, that's where the word user comes from because we were using certain tools, user. But right now it feels like we're not users anymore. We're sensors in the system that we do not control or understand. And it's very safe to say that right now our Earth, our planet, our planet has a data sphere, like you know, atmosphere, biosphere, ion sphere, all other spheres. Right now, there is a data sphere because data is not going anywhere, and it can be mined. And if you understand what I'm saying, if you've been listening very carefully to the previous slide, you understand that. And I did this picture on purpose. How simplistic the human behavior is. You can predict pretty much everything that you will go to work at certain amount of time in certain period of time use those uh, specific channels you will listen to certain media you will read certain books or not read certain books you will listen to certain uh, political pictures you will vote to certain people you will go to vacation to specific countries you are either pro kids or you are anti family you are either pro vaccines or you are anti everything can be told and the trick is this data right now is owned by everybody uh, but us and by the way, just so you know, 
And a lot of companies right now, because I get this request a lot, a lot of companies out there, they can know whatever you're cheating on your husband or wife. They just do not share this information. But they imagine that basically hackers do a better job at this. We actually will face an era of of revising of, re of re revisioning what the family is. So, for those of you who don't have technical degrees or technical education or awareness of big data, I just created this slide of showing like how it works simplistically. Imagine a weather forecast. It's just very similar to that. If you have enough data about uh, uh, atmospheric pressure, temperatures over time, and certain patterns and how it deals uh, cold streams with hot streams and all that you will understand how to predict weather. We're not doing a good job at it like humanity, but still we can predict a lot. And some of uh, you might be interested, okay, Big Brother is everywhere, uh, Edward Snowden told it, many people are uh, raising red flags. How did we come to the point where everything is tracked? Did you ever ask yourself this question? Like, why are we living in a society that tries to build digital clones out of everybody? And I, can't, I have an answer to that today for you. Uh, because first people who lived in the internet, they were too smart. And what I mean um, by that is a very specific uh, setup. Because the first uh, dwellers, well, you know, people who lived in the internet, they were who? Students and the military, mostly. Because it's technically, originally, it's a military tech uh, d developed uh, in the uh, MIT in US. And basically, because of the fact that first users of the internet, they were very smart with degrees in, in science, in mathematics, in physics, in computer science, because computer science existed back then, you couldn't sell anything to them. Because when you created certain products such as you know, media content, which is a very laughable experience, and Microsoft had been fighting for that for years, let's say you started to sell content to the first internet users. They said, we, we won't buy it, just internet is free for everybody. You wanted to sell them services, they said, we won't pay, we just don't care. And then basically most of the businesses, they said, okay, typical business models, they don't work in the internet. We have to do something. And this is where tracking start, started, because software developers, they started to do what we call today a freemium model. So they just started to give software for free, like literally for free and then uh, triggered a purchasing uh, event over, let's say, 30 days. So basically, you get a product, you try it, and then in 30 days, you either buy it or continue to use a freemium version, which is very limited. And some people started to pay, but most people, they still decided that the internet should be free, and they cracked all the protection uh, methods and all that. But uh, the companies, they started to track uh, at this point, at, at which point people decide not to pay. So you've been using the product, you've been doing certain things, and then, bam, you decide, okay, I'm going to delete this app. And you, as a manufacturer, so producer of the product, you said, no, I want to sell it to you, what I did wrong. Like, honestly, like, tell me what I did wrong. But instead of asking people, they decided to track the behavior, and it ended up in the situation we are living in today. Everybody tracks everything. Like, mostly companies, they just track everything, and their intent initially was good. The problem is, all bad situations that start with a good intent. <laughs> so my point is, we have to do something about it. Because again, for those of you who don't understand how granular tracking is, this is a very simplistic example. Uh, as a you know, as a clock, you see certain types of activities in a certain period of the day. So about 4 p.m. and you can do. You can just do a phone call, you can just be shopping or praying or walking or whatever. My point is you cannot be in a lot of blocks at the same time. And if you're a marketing specialist, you can always understand how to reach to you, which is very weird. And again, psychology, done thing. Yeah, there is a certain amount of, um, of error in how computers, they can predict your mood or state of your psychology, but still, they can do that. We are totally scored, like, you know, for whatever we can pay your credit, whatever you can buy a car, whatever you're voting for certain parties, whatever you want to get married, everything is scored. And uh, basically, even if you can pay your rent, right now, this map, for example, you can see people who can pay rent and those who can't, which is very important for banks. And plus, it's applied for like 30, just name any activity, like for example, 
mining for new resources like coal. You can you want to find oh, coal is a bad example. Let's say for oil. If you want to find a new uh, place to dig for oil, right now big data is applied as well because there are certain patterns, uh, environmental patterns, where you can understand. Okay, this setup here. If you look at this from the satellite and apply thermovision and other uh, methods, you can say, okay, oil is here. And uh, even that is possible today. And of course, marketing. Of course, marketing. But my problem with marketing, and I have very deep marketing experience, is a very simplistic. First of all, does anyone know this man? No? Come on, people, Firefly. Serious. Okay. <laughs> I sincerely recommend you watch it. So the problem is right now, uh, most of the time, you're buying stuff that a company wants to sell, not what you truly need. And it's a huge difference in between the things. Actually, people do not, do not need a lot of things. They just need very little. But my point is nobody actually is trying to think about it. And a lot of companies are built on that. And uh, I work with startups a lot. And a lot of startups, they just don't want to do products anymore. Because the main products in 2021 is how to sell more products. They just come to you and say, I created a new stuff, I created a new tech that will help us sell more. Sell more what? Like, maybe you will start to build something, like create something, even if it's hardware. Nobody wants to do hardware. Like, very few even start to do build software. They just, technically, most of the startups, they are into buying more build, uh, uh, business. And uh, this is where I'm leading with digital me. A lot of thanks to those activities, and of course, I'm very short of time, I cannot tell you about you know, most of the activities that we're facing, uh, most of the jobs, they're in danger. And nobody, I don't see a lot of conversation about that. Because uh, I actually did some math. There's a lot of, there's about 20 million Uber drivers and taxi drivers in the, in the world. If you combine all the sharing companies, 20 million people, what will they do tomorrow when driverless cars will be public? Like, what they will, nobody thinks about that. But we embrace uh, driverless cars. Same goes with delivery. There are a lot of people working as couriers. They just deliver stuff. What, they will, what will they do when basically drones and autonomous cars will serve as delivery vehicles? God knows how many are those. I even, I, even engineers are in danger because this specific uh, design of a car chassis was created by a machine. No engineer even touched it. And uh, this is a uh, table done by McKinsey. And of course, it's a bit controversial because uh, we're all in the pandemic, so it affects the numbers. But the point is, uh, only 23% of the companies, they do not fire employees today. And it's not because of COVID. Uh, COVID is a very important uh, trigger, but basically everybody tries to exclude people from the chain of making decisions. And uh, this is a common slide. Not really, because actually uh, I want you to think about the things, because I even skipped the military. I skipped a lot of uh, things like uh, cloned food. I'm going to just stick to just slide, this slide, and you might ask, like, what does cloned food, what does it, how is that connected to AI and jobs? Well, very, very easy. I created this slide. This is, uh, I did some math. And uh, everything that is uh, farming and, you know, basically growing animals like, uh, cows that we use for steaks and crops that we use for bread and all that, all together, it's 26% of the workforce. And right now, when you're created clone, when you're creating cloned uh, meats and artificial meats, you are disrupting this industry. And it's good. We, I do not understand, I mean, do not get me wrong. It's a good thing. We might get healthier. We will get better nutrition and we will solve maybe human hunger problems. But at the same time, we will kill potentially up to 20, 20 well, I'm not sure about the exact number, but 26% 20, of people living on this planet, they are actually in the, in the risk of losing their jobs because of automation, uh, cloning, artificial, artificial food and all that. And... Uh, and this is a number basically given by McKinsey a couple of years ago. So they, like their forecast is we will lose 80 million jobs by 2030. I personally think they're optimistic. I think it's going to be about a billion. Uh, and uh, why did I start with life one, life two, life three? Uh, we don't have time, so I'm going to skip the video. Uh, basically, it's a monkey. You all heard about the experiments that Elon Musk does with Neuralink. So basically, it's a mon monkey playing a game with using nothing by a wireless chip implanted in, in, into his, his brain. I think it's the right way to go. 
because we already released the Kraken, the, the genie out of the bottle. The, there's no way no, someone will stop or control artificial intelligence expansion. There's no way it can be done. And the only point, uh, uh, the only choice we might make today is to actually understand why the monkey did take the stick and became this non-organic type of life, hijacking evolution. I think we have to consider a path where we start to think about becoming life number four. So basically emerge in between human and machine, but on our terms. Because if we don't do it on our terms, in a hundred years from now, the terms would be different. We won't even have a choice. Machines will be there. And I'm not trying to scare you or whatever, but it's just, uh, I'm working with the AI very intensely. So trust me when I say this. So this is, those are three types of AI that exist. Narrow intelligence, this is what we have right now. General intelligence is when intelligence, artificial intelligence can do what any human being can do, at least with the same quality. And it's okay, we're getting there. And super intelligence is when AI can do anything what the best of the people can, so even the best of our science uh, specialists can do, so it can, can create new stuff. And then we're doomed somewhere here. And I don't see how we survive. It's a matter of survival as species. We just, we just won't matter anymore. I'm a gamer, well, I used to be, before I started my first business. So I love to look at, the, uh, at life uh, as, as a game. Uh, if we do some mathematics, uh, human life is roughly 700,000 hours, and we need some time to sleep. And basically, as I told you, before we are 16, we are learning a lot, like no activities are there. When we are after 60, with all the respect, we share wisdom, we just help. But it's not like you will create a revolution when you're 65 or 70. Well, it happens, but very rarely. My point is, we have 19,000 days to do anything, really, fly to Mars, create new AI, protect yourself from AI, create a good Terminator, create a non-cloned burger, whatever. 19,000 days, and you have to write it down, because if you don't, your life had no meaning. And the machines, they know that, that's, that's why they write everything. And they never lose track of what they're doing. It's a very hard path, to be honest, but Che once says, Che, the Che Guevara guy, not me. He once said, like, if you find a path with no obstacles, it probably, probably leads nowhere, uh, which is a good motto, and I sincerely thank you for, for your attention and being here today with me. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Um, I'll be happy to, yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. I have several questions to you. Question number one. You've said a lot about predictability of people. It's easy to predict people. We know what will happen next. But I think this is like a valley universe where we sit and all decisions are pre-written, pre-designed for us. Do you agree to the fact that this is the future we are facing today? Because it looks like it's going to be like that. And the second question, you said you divide people into two, into two groups, cubes and spheres. The previous speaker, Mr. Keen, said that people like Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, whom you call spheres, must be controlled and certain limitations should be imposed on those people. I will answer in Russian. So I'll answer in Russian. I totally disagree with statement number two. Why? Because people, and this is a disclaimer, I do not want to be biased against anybody. I'm just talking as an engineer. People who do not achieve anything uh, have nothing more, more terrifying than those who achieve something. Elon Musk is a problem because he does things. He can achieve achieve things without asking for nobody's permission. Society shall always impose constraints on people who open up new horizons. Let us remember 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. People, women were getting killed for just being beautiful. Can you evaluate the level of stupidity in the Middle Ages? 
Or how about another guy who opened up the new laws of interaction between the heavenly bodies? Guys like Copernic, Giordano Bruno, basically. So my point is that innovative persons are rare quite rare in our life, and they should be supported. And those people, they're like painters, like artists, they're not protected, they're fragile emotionally and psychologically. Such people need help and support. Let us remember Van Gogh. People get to love Van Gogh only after his death. The person is gone, but now everybody knows that he is a super genius, so I categorically disagree. It is not feasible and prudent to impose constraints on people who create innovations. Now about question number one. Basically, do we live in the society where all decisions are made for us, or are we going there? Yes, we already are there in that kind of society. This is my subjective assessment, together with professional assessment, combined together. So let's take a person who has the access to television and cyberspace, and out of that quantity, only 10% are free people. Because if you want to buy one T-shirt, you just buy one T-shirt, and this is it. I like a white T-shirt, and I don't want any word like Prado written on that T-shirt. So, and I do believe that very often you buy things because you need them, not because somebody is agitating or propagating things uh, in your mind. So, and the main thing here is those 10% of free people, and I'm sure such people are present here. Out of those 10%, other, uh, some people are active, those who create something. So, answering honestly your question, the advice, we already are there. We already live in the predictable world, and uh, when you cannot predict things, who's going to assume responsibility? For example, very often I have arguments with people who represent various religious religions, you know. A person who realistically wants to understand the constitution of the world sooner or later will come to the religion. And such a person, such a person shall treat the rest like illusion. Religion gives confidence about the future. If you don't have that confidence, and for free wars I talking about 19,000 days, we are all mortals. People do not think about mortality. They want to have their joy satisfied here. And today, you probably know George Orwell, 1984, 70% of his prophecies already have been implemented. 30% are yet to come. So, more questions? Are we done? We've just got one last question, okay? All right, all right, uh, sure. If we could be fairly brief, okay? Thank of course, you. of course. So, um... As a person with a chip inside you, how do you feel about the fact that people are scared of being chipped from vaccinations? And how much is it possible to implant a chip through an injection? It's a very good question. If you don't mind, so, so they understand it better. Uh, so if you talk about chips, uh, recently there was a good joke on Twitter by a German physician. That physician said, why are you afraid of chips inside vaccines? I'm a dentist, and we've been chipping you for 20 years. Sooner or later, you will come to a dentist. And you know, you've been coming for me for 20 years. I'm replacing your tooth, and each of your new tooth has a radar. It was a mistake. It was just a joke. But the joke was supposed to demonstrate the level of absurdity we have achieved in the course of our discussions.
То есть он без батарейки жить не может. So basically, of course, a cheap cannot survive without a battery. If I have a chip inside my body, I'm supposed to have a battery inside my body. So the brief answer to your question is: injecting chips by means of vaccination is technically possible, but you won't be capable of recording something in there or making any manipulations with the body through the chip because the chip does not have a battery. You know, you can you can bring your iPad, put it into the tree, and then think that by means of your iPad but in that tree you will manage the life of the tree and its genesis. So basically, Elon Musk was the first one to explore that thing. He implanted chip into an ape. It was a big chip and uh, it was a surgical operation. So really, uh, vaccination and chipping, this is something funny.